Hello, everybody, and welcome to MIT Sloan Executive Education's Innovation at Work webinar. Uh, my name is Rob Deedle. I'm the Director of Executive Programs here at MIT Sloan, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for today's webinar, Getting Beyond Remote, Empowering the Next AI. Uh, it's a fairly short webinar. We have a lot of material to cover, but we're also looking forward to engaging with you, uh, as Janice mentioned, with, with Q&A, and we'll also have an interactive poll later in the session. But at this point, I'm delighted to let you know that we've got a wonderful faculty member from MIT here. Michael Schrade uh, is a research fellow here at the MIT Sloan School of Management, who works in the Initiative on the Digital Economy. In addition to being an author of several books and a frequent contributor to business publications, Michael also works very closely with companies on important issues to both them and their industries. Uh, he does this both directly with the companies, but also through his work here at MIT Sloan with Executive Education and MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. Uh, what we're going to cover today in our short time together is really the, the need for greater situational work and organizational awareness in digitally dispersed environments. This is a reflection of what's happening with the big shift to remote working that we've seen over the last several months and anticipate going forward. Michael will also touch upon analytics and the role that data can play in helping managers and organizations cope with this trend. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of information to cover. So Michael, over to you and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Rob. And I want to thank uh, Janice and Anna for, for helping set this up. You're right, we don't have a lot of time. So if I seem to be talking at a more rapid pace than humanly comfortable, it's because I am. But I'm very grateful for the people logging on to this. And I really believe there's some important issues here to raise in this brief seminar going beyond remote, because I want to talk about what I believe is going to be the most important AI for higher performance. And it may not be the kind of AI that you think. It is important though that you understand a quick bit of the context for this. I've done work with Deloitte and McKinsey and Google in this realm of how can we look at the role technology plays with human capital, capital development? How do we improve KPIs and metrics? How can we really explore and exploit data and analytics for insights to become more productive and improve higher performance. So this is part of an ongoing research theme for me over the last decade. And let's begin with where everybody is, remote. Everybody is working in a remote, distributed, dispersed environment. I'm sorry to say that the most recent news indicates that our efforts to reconnect physically, face-to-face -face in offices may have to be put off as COVID I won't say resurges, but isn't getting better as quickly as we thought. So the question is, what do we do in these sorts of environments? And when I was initially, when this began, I was approached by a lot of the organizations that I worked with and by students in my exec ed classes. And these are people who self-select. They're not just interested in making do or be good enough. They were coming and asking, how can we get our people to perform better in this environment? What does better mean? What can we do to improve people's performance in remote, distributed, and dispersed environments? And the most important thing that I learned in listening to them and preliminarily working with them is that in fact, much to many people's surprise, including my own, remote work works. But most people, and certainly most managers, don't really know or understand how work really gets done in this environment. Is it Zoom meetings, Slack channels, Yammer, Teams? You know, it's, it's a black box or a translucent box, and people really aren't certain how stuff gets done. So long as it gets done, that's the important thing. So long as people are delivering, that's the important thing. It's the important thing, but it's not enough. And so the point and purpose of this talk is, what does it mean to measurably, and that's going to be key, measurably improve remote performance? And I would like you to step back and ask yourself and have this question in the back of your mind moving forward as the next 10 minutes go on. How do you and your organization define and determine high performance? 
And remember, we're not just talking about high performance. We're now talking about high performance within the digital and distant constraints of remote work and distributed workforces. What do you want high performance to mean? And so this brief talk is really going to be about what does it mean to measurably improve organizational awareness around high performance factors. I want you thinking really, really hard about high performance factors in this environment. And how do we know? Are we situationally and organizationally aware in the way that we should be? So what this talk is really about is AI. Not the sort of AI that stands for artificial intelligence, but the sort of AI, pardon the acronymic pun, that stands for augmented introspection. How do we use technology to get greater insight into ourselves? That's the key. That's the perceptual shift I'm urging you to take seriously and act upon. Because I want you to come away from this very brief seminar thinking about how should we be investing in AI? How should my organization, how should my team, how should my enterprise, how should my process invest in the technologies and tools of augmented introspection? Many, if not most of you have iPhones or Androids, you understand the notion of the quantified self come up with that was created by my old editors at Wired you know, back in 2007, the whole notion of self-knowledge through number. Numbers, you instrument yourself, you track yourself, self-monitoring, self-tracking. We've seen more recently companies like Google's, I think this book is excellent, from Laszlo Bach. He did a, he's done a startup called Humu, but he was the chief people officer at, at Google for a while, and the whole notion of people analytics. And this is a company that takes human capital very seriously and so wants to boost its return on human capital. So how do we instrument and analyze the human capital we have to become more productive? What does people analytics mean? So the precedent for all of this exists, but there's a difference between precedent and imperative, and the imperative is now. My call to action is these environments this environment creates a call to action where I'm going to ask you to learn to digitally measure and digitally measure to learn. What do you want to learn to digitally measure? Why? How do you align learning to measure with measuring to learn? This is at the core of the way I would like you to think about how you're going to answer what we want high performance to mean in a distributed dispersed environment. But that's hypothetical. Let's talk real world. So one of the organizations that approached me was, we shall call them BGB for Big Global Bank. Tens of thousands of people all over the world. All working at home, all working at home. Okay, they managed to get things up and running. Their IT systems were really good. And they approach me not, so how do we run these things? What can, what can we learn from this? How can we take advantage and learn? So what was one of the things we discussed? And this creates interesting data governance and data analytics issue. Geez, why don't you start tagging data and tagging workflows and run a social network analysis algorithm over it? For key processes, what are the hubs? What are the outliers? What, are, what is the, set, forgive me, the centrality of the social network? Are there two hubs? Are they rival? Are they complementary? In a pre-COVID era, it would have been not pointless, but it wouldn't have been as helpful because you, you spoil the data by having all these people meet face-to-face -face and on the phone and such. Now we can instrument the workflows. We can instrument the digital flows and C, distributed and dispersed workforces make algorithms like social network analysis more value for augmented introspection. But how do people feel about what's going on? Well, most of the organizations I worked with began to double or even triple the number of uh, uh, worker engagement surveys. How do you feel, et cetera, et cetera. 
all very good. I think it's important to know how people are feeling in these times of stress. But you know what else we can do? We can look at the Slack channel communications. We can look at the email communications inside the firewall and do sentiment analysis. How are people, are different parts of the world feeling differently or communicating differently? What are the key words? You all know wordles and word clouds. What's the most common kind of communication? What's the sentiment attached to that? This is a way of gaining insight. And I wanna say something that's key. All the data is there and the cost of analyzing this, the cost of processing this is marginal, not major. A decade ago, not so marginal. Today, it's incremental. What do we need to improve organizational awareness around? How people feel, the formal as well as informal networks that drive the organization, simple, scalable, impactful data. I think time is important. How many of your organizations, how many of you have downloaded time tracking software to see how you're actually spending time on your machine or how your colleagues are spending time on their machines? What would that look like in a time tracker dashboard thing? We talk about return on assets. Are we assessing what time we get the most return or best return on, on an individual basis, on a team basis, on a collaborative basis? Indeed, to what extent are we sharing our KPIs, our key performance indicator dashboards? Should we be creating communities of interaction and accountability around the metrics that matter? These are the kinds of serious questions that the organizations I'm spending time with and listening to are not just asking, but they're beginning to answer. Here's an example of a new digital capability that a law firm was dealing with. And, and we had interesting conversations about it. I, to be honest with you, I haven't followed through completely on this because a lot's been going on. But here was a law firm that developed, that acquired transcriptions as a service, okay? So they would always transcribe client meetings. Well, guess what happened with COVID? With COVID, people couldn't meet face-to-face. -face. So this organization made the commitment to record and transcribe all of its meetings, internal as well as clients. And so at the beginning, at the end of the day, you'd get the transcripts of all the meetings that you were in. Well, that's a bloody waste of time, isn't it? So they would appoint various scribes to, to take out the highlights of this. So how do we know that we're getting value from transcripts as a service? We began coming up with metrics. What was the most valuable quote in a conversation? What's the most shared quote? What's the most usable or useful quote? And ROI in this context doesn't stand for return on investment, it stands for return on iteration. As we iterate through conversations and documents, are we hitting diminishing returns or are we getting more value from it? What's one of the KPIs? Does it lead to billability? Okay, how do you align most valuable quote or most shareable quote with billability? How do you create alignment with these metrics? How do we learn to align the metrics here? So let me put my cards on the table. Yes, I am describing a world where workforce monitoring and surveillance is going to increase, has to increase, because self-knowledge is key to self-improvement. There's no two ways about it. And that creates enormous cultural and organizational concerns because if you turn these surveillance technologies into issues of compliance and control, as opposed to empowerment and improvement, you're going to shoot your organization's culture, if not in the foot, straight in the head. So you've got to be really, really, really thoughtful and intentional about what learning means, as opposed to what compliance and control means. I believe, I'm old fashioned this way, <clears throat> that actions speak louder than words. I think the surveillance that we're talking about, the monitoring that we're talking about, is not just top down in a social panopticon way. There's more transparency for leaders, but I think we're going to have to see more transparency from leaders. Are you, the leader, sharing your calendar? How should leaders lead by example when it comes to transparency, metrics, personal and professional improvement?
I think this is one of the most important questions going forward, and I hope this becomes part of the conversation that we have, because ultimately, ultimately, culture matters as much or more than strategy in this environment. You know the Peter Drucker line that culture eats strategy for breakfast or for lunch, whatever. Culture eats strategy. I am talking as much about culture as I am about strategy, and I want to make it clear that I understand and recognize this because the greatest performance frustrations, this is not about the money. It's not about the technology. You have the money, you have the technology. You don't have much choice. How are you going to organizationally and culturally deal with these things? I think you need to craft a performance management manifesto. I think you need to be very clear about the kind of contract and aspiration you're creating with and for the workforce. We can talk about this, but ultimately let's, let's talk a bit about the future. In a remote dispersed environment, we're all cyborgs. We're all dependent upon digital technologies and tools and techniques to be productive, to be collaborative, to be coordinative, to get work done. We are all cyborgs now. What kind of cyborgs do we want to be? It is remarkable how technology can transform productivity and capability. It's remarkable. I hope that organizationally and culturally, we're taking it as seriously as we should be. Cyborgs learn to digitally measure. Cyborgs digitally measure to learn. That's what leadership and management have to be about going forward in this environment. Those are my remarks. That's my email for those of you who wish to flame me personally. But before I get flamed personally, I would like to switch back to Robert so that he can facilitate and moderate and be the interlocutor for your remarks and our poll. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. You've certainly given us all a lot to think about in a relatively short period of time. Before we transition into the Q&A period, and I do see that we've already had some questions submitted from the audience, uh, we'd like to ask the audience an, an interactive poll question. So right now, you should be seeing a poll on your screen. We'd ask that you just take a moment to respond to that poll, and then very briefly, we will share the, uh, the results of the poll. While we're doing that, Michael, while the audience is doing that, I do have a question for you. It seems that much of the augmented introspection behavior is a fairly obvious thing for managers and organizations to do. With that in mind, why aren't more organizations currently doing this? Um, first and foremost, I agree with the premise of the question. Secondly, I don't know, which is one of the reasons why this is the case. Um, I I'm going to give you a polite answer and a cynical answer. The polite answer is that organizations are so busy and intent on doing what they need to do that, that they're more in survival mode than in improvement mode. The, the, the cynical answer is most organizations look at their existing processes and their immediate question is how do we improve our existing processes? The great thing about big global bank was that they said, we, we know our, existing processes, what new things can we be doing to inform what we're doing? We all heard of social network analysis. Oh my goodness, we actually could do this. If you think about it, it's a no lose for them because either that social network analysis is going to affirm how they've structured things so that reinforces how they're organized or it's going to generate contrary signals and say, geez, why is there this gap between the way we've formally organized and the way the social network and analytics demonstrate there are other informal networks that impact? The key is some organizations are more interested in learning than others. That's why you come to MIT. <laughs> Great point. Um, we do have several questions coming in from the audience and I see a trend in a few of them. Can you comment on- um, Wow, forgive me, there's the poll number. Oh, wonderful. I see the poll results are up right now. So has okay. your organization created any new metrics to measure the impact of remote work on people's performance? And uh, uh, This is more important than anything I have to say. Very 
interesting. Clearly a majority in the, in the, in the no category, but it'll be, it would be interesting to see if in, in several months' time how these results might change. I, I would be happy to be of assistance for some of those organizations, but 80%, I mean, that's, it, it's not 60, 40, 70, that's a big, that's a gap. And, and look at the, forgive me for going on for 10 more seconds, look at the bias of this audience. This audience is coming here because they want to learn, because they do want to do new things. You would think that, that, an or, that they're from organizations that are more open to this. So it really ties in beautifully with the first question you asked me. Well, thank you for the audience for responding to that poll. And as now as we move into some of the additional questions, I'm seeing a trend, several people asking about either your preference or the availability of current tools, uh, sentiment analysis tools or social media influencer tools, ready for prime time tools. What's available and do you have any preferences? Um, that, that is a good question, but it falls to me in the category of a trick question, because I would need to know more about the organization. Here's what I'm comfortable saying, very comfortable saying. Um, and, and by the way, we have people like it at MIT, Sinana Rao, Dean Eccles. We do at MIT work on social network analysis. I mean, you talk to ILP, talk to exec ed. I mean, we have people, Dimitri Bertsimus, we've got the analytic infrastructure for that. The algorithms here, some of them are open source. You can get them off of GitHub. Some of them you could quote unquote pay for. The challenge you're going to have, but it's a good challenge is you're gonna to have to get your data in shape. Do you, you know, do you have access to your logs so that it would be easy to do this kind of analysis? I have no, I'm agnostic. My view is though, there's an embarrassment of riches out there for social network analysis, for sentiment analysis, for, for time management. There's toggle, there's rescue time, there's clockify. You can do it on an individual basis. You can do it on a team basis. My suggestion would be if you take time as a dimension seriously, put together a little task force and start circulating it. Ask people, do they want to monitor their laptop? Do they want to monitor their device? Do they want to do both? How do you build privacy protection? Do you want to do this, with, as is the case with MIT uh, executive, ed, executive Ed? Do we have shared calendars? That's the other question we could have asked. Do you share calendars? Do you have point-to-point -point access or is there a community calendar? These are no longer hypothetical questions. These are mission critical questions for organizations that care about improving performance in a distributed environment. The good news is there's more choice for less money. Your challenge is going to be exactly what I was headbanging about, organizational and cultural. It ain't the money. It ain't the technology. Thank you. Another question related to data quality. Uh, is, is there any length of time or do you, do you have any experience working with organizations in terms of uh, uh, how long they may, may need to collect data uh, through these dashboards and these tools to be able to identify trends or um, make assumptions or, or connections based on productivity? So that is also a great question and it, it, it points to my hidden agenda. My hidden agenda is as follows. If data is really an asset, how are you managing it as an asset? What kind of data governance do you do? I could not do a data governance talk in 15 or 20 minutes and nobody would sign up for it because it says, oh my God, it's data governance, it's eat your, eat your peas. But data, you're, the questioner is exactly right. Data is the enabler and I want all organizations to have healthier conversations around how they get value from data. What's the weasel way I'm doing it? Gee, what data do we need to have sustainable high performance improvement? So that is the teleology, that's the purpose to which the data would be put. But the questioner is exactly right. To do these things seriously, you have to take data seriously. If we did another poll question, I'd say, how good of a job of data governance does your organization do? You know what? I bet it's going to align with the 88% of people who said we haven't come up with a new metric. Data governance is key. Thank you. A 
question regarding uh, reflective time that may be invisible, time that a person may be performing routine work or possibly even cleaning their house under current conditions, but thinking about an issue. Some would argue that this noodling time is critical to effective decisions and even creativity. How do the metrics capture that? Well, I like that question. I'm a big fan of Michael Polanyi's book, Personal Knowledge, and tacit knowledge, explicit knowledge. Um, you know, you may not be able to capture that in, in, in this environment. And, you know, we'll go back to Google. Remember, Google in the early days had, you know, personal time, 15% time. I'm going to turn the bug of that question into a feature, which is, let's have manage, managers in that manifesto that I talk about, let's have managers acknowledge that not everything that we measure, you know, not everything that is measurable is measured and not everything that we should measure should be measured should be measured. Um, how do you want to put reflection in there and off work time in there? Donald Schoen, the late Donald Schoen, who also was at MIT, the reflective practitioner was a champion of that. But right now, that's too sophisticated a challenge. I want to begin with, let's do the basics before we deal with the more sophisticated aspects of how, ref how do we do a good job of capturing reflection. Let's, let's recognize reflection from the get-go, but let's have that be a part of what we're doing, not a driver of what we're doing at this time. I think we need to begin at the beginning. Thank you, Michael. And I see that we just have a few minutes left. I apologize to the audience. We had a, a great number of questions uh, that were submitted, and unfortunately, we just don't have time to get to them all today. Uh, Michael, if I could ask you to, to bring up the slides again, there's just a few more closing points we'd like to make. Uh, but while we're doing that, I'd like to thank you again for your time today in, in not only providing us with some wonderful uh, ideas and, and, and your research and, and what you covered in your presentation, but also thoughtfully responding to the questions that we did get. Um, as we move forward with the, with the last few minutes that we have, some of you may be interested in other programs that we teach and run throughout the year. I'd just like to call your attention to our executive program and general management that will be running uh, from November to July. All of our program details are available on our website at executive.mit.edu. Additionally, you'll be able to find a recording of this webinar and a whole library of other past webinars that we've run through our Innovation uh, at Work webinar series. Uh, next week, uh, Michael had mentioned Sanan Aral is one of our faculty here that does social media analysis. Sanan is my new boss. What's that? He's my new boss. He's becoming new the boss. director of the IDE. And also author of a, a very new and timely book. Um, so we hope you'll be able to join us next week, July 9th, when Sanan Aral is our host uh, for next week's webinar. And with that, uh, I believe that brings us to the end of our program. I'd like to thank you again, Michael, for your time. I'd like to thank the exec ed staff for all their help in organizing and hosting this webinar. It's been a pleasure to be with you and our audience. I hope you all enjoyed today's webinar, and we hope to see you back here online again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.